All right, well, welcome to our overview session on the transactional clinics. It's great to see everybody here. Um, let me just share with you, um, well, first, I'm Jeff Leslie. I'm the Director of Clinical and Experiential Learning, uh, and I'm joined by colleagues uh, David Zarfus and Josh Avertine from the Corporate Lab Clinic, Emily Underwood from the Innovation Clinic, uh, and Beth Krieger from the IJ Clinic on Entrepreneurship. Um, so we'll spend uh, most of the hour describing for you uh, each of our clinics is to give uh, all of you students a, an overview of what each of these clinics does. And we've grouped all the transactional clinics together in this session because there are some similarities and commonalities that make sense to address. Uh, the real meat of it though, I wanted to give um, particularly the one else who have joined us just a brief overview of how you sign up for clinics, how you register for clinics uh, in your 2L and 3L year. So the clinics are um, part of a normal uh, course registration process. Um, so you register for clinics in the same way and at the same time that you register for all of your other courses. Uh, and what that means for fall quarter is you would get an email from the registrar in August, uh, usually around mid-August, uh, to let you know that the registration process is open for the fall quarter. Um, and the clinics will be Part of the online registration or the list of courses that you can sign up for. Um, depending on whether the clinician expects the clinic to be oversubscribed or not, um, the clinic will be in one of, kind of two buckets in that registration system. There's a bid enrollment um, process for classes that are limited enrollment um, where we anticipate we might have more um, people bidding for classes and we, and we have spots. So some clinics will be in that system. Then the majority of our clinics are in the open enrollment system where it's basically first come first serve and you just sign up for a slot that way. Um, so you will be getting details from the registrar's office about how to access that portal. Um, that's generally the process um, for the fall quarter. Most of the clinics open up most of their seats in the fall quarter. That's when we have the, new, the biggest influx of new students coming in to the clinic. Uh, we do also have seats that come available in winter or spring. And the process for those is the same. Um, usually in uh, November, the registration portal will open up uh, for winter quarter registration. Uh, and then uh, sometime in February, the portal will open up for spring quarter registration. But again, most of the seats open up in fall, and that's when we uh, see the, the biggest influx of students. Um, for students who are working for us over the summer, and I see some of them in this group, um, those students are treated as returning students for the clinic in fall. Um, so assuming they, they wish to continue in their clinical project in the fall, uh, they don't need to, uh, we pre-register them essentially uh, to continue on in the clinic in fall quarter. Um, all right, so with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to uh, substantive presentations from our clinicians. Um, each presentation will be uh, roughly 10 minutes, which should give us uh, time for questions at the end. So let's hold questions to the end, and we can also address any questions about the registration process if people have them. Okay, so let's start um, with the Kirkland and Ellis Corporate Lab Clinic, David Zarfus and Josh Avertine. Our approach, Josh and my approach, is really just to tell you briefly what they hope about the clinic. And then we're going, we've invited some students who have kindly agreed to tell you about their experiences in the clinic. So uh, essentially, we try to provide students with the type of experience they will likely have should they go into big law and the, the large firms. So most of our clients are Fortune 200 types of companies. We have a number of well-funded startups. We have several um, Pritzker-funded startups, and we work with the new venture folks at Booth in the spring quarter. So it's, it's I'd say it's about 80% large companies and maybe 20% small companies startups. Um, the, we tell our clients that we, we want them to give us real work experience. So it's work that arises um, in real time. So it's not that we, we can plan three or four months ahead to know what the matters will be. Rather, it's we give clients sort of the timing of when we'll be there 
And as matters arise organically, they come to us with those matters. Uh, we stress, you know, client you know, diligence, follow up, um, and uh, being prepared. Uh, and we we solicit the client's input um, in, when it comes to evaluating students. Um, in normal times, uh, not pre-pandemic pandemic times, we would typically socialize with some of these clients, whether it be the, the local ones, IBM, Accenture, those type of clients that would involve anything from drinks to dinners or lunches, but the idea would be to try to give people the opportunity to, to meet these clients and, uh, and get to know them. Josh, maybe I'll turn it over to you briefly, and then we'll turn it over to Matthew, uh, Matthew Jessica, and Mika. Hi, everyone. Just to introduce myself quickly, uh, I'm, I'm Josh Averton. I'm the other professor in, in the corporate lab. Uh, I'm a graduate of the law school in 2012, and I was actually in the corporate lab as a student um, during my time in the law school, and you know, I, I enjoyed it so much that, that I came back to teaching it, and I really did feel that um, the corporate lab provided me with, with a significant leg up as compared to most of my peers going into, into a big law setting where I had already worked with a number of large clients, and I had worked on um, on a, on a variety of, of um, different subject matter, either um, assignments, whether it was memos, we do a lot of um, contract drafting for, for our clients. Sometimes we help um, our new, our smaller startup clients with like incorporation and corporate governance. Uh, it, it really is a sort of generalist approach that you would take at um, inside of a, a, a corporate legal department. We we don't really have any areas that we specialize in or require our clients to give us work from. We kind of take everything that comes to us with the exception of super specialized areas like intellectual property, uh, healthcare and stuff like that. The IP will, will take license agreements, I would say. We obviously won't take patents or anything of that type. Uh, Josh, maybe sure. tell a little about your background and then I'll tell about my background. Yeah, um, and so after law school, I worked uh, at Sidley Austin here in Chicago and at Goodwin Proctor in Boston doing debt finance at both firms. And I was also in-house at Groupon doing uh, corporate uh, M&A and securities for them. And for me, I was general counsel of Capgemini Ernst & Young for about 15 years. That's the Ernst & Young Consulting Organization. I practiced with uh, Laura Carrington, and um, I also taught at Columbia Law School. So with that, perhaps we'll turn to Matthew. Let's just jump to our clients. Um, I think if you, you know, if you take a look at this list, you can see that we really get to work with a lot of fantastic clients, large and small. And the, the work is really, really quite fantastic and, and covers a pretty broad range of things. Um, if we flip to the next slide, I just want to talk through some, the range of projects that, that we take on through the lab. This is just a sampling of some of the things that we've done. Um, but I just want to emphasize that, that the work that we've done in the lab ranges from bread and butter contract drafting to legal research, memoranda, and briefs. And we've also done all kinds of other projects from presentations for, for business people, uh, board directors, and, and legal teams. So it's really a huge diversity of work and we've been able to do it for marquee clients. So we're really fortunate in that regard. I wanna comment on the, I guess, non-work related enrichment activities that we have at the lab. So we have a number of different extracurriculars you can participate in. So in the, all three of the academic quarters, we bring in a series of speakers in the lab speaker series. They're attorneys or people who are in practice right now, and they can be from firms, they can be from like in-house, and they come talk about substantive issues in their field. So for example, we've had people come in and talk about a bunch of transactional practice areas. So like people come in from real estate, tax, project finance. Next week, we have someone coming in from uh, Kearney. He's another lab alum. And right now he works for a management consultant providing like consulting services services for in-house attorneys, which I think is just like a really cool intersection of law and business. We also have different modules, more than just speaker series, but actual events that you can participate in. So every year we have a mock cross-border negotiation with a team from Israel. I did it my second year. I thought it was really interesting. You learn two things, one, how to mock negotiate, and two, how to deal with people who are halfway across the world and just work on a different time schedule and also with a different cultural like and have a different cultural flows than you do. Lastly, we sometimes have workshops with 
practitioners from Kirkle and Ellis, like so for example, this year, someone came in and gave us um, a taught a module on derivatives. The year before that, we had another negotiation workshop, but this time we were negotiating against other people in the lab. At this point, we'll turn things over to, to Micah, who's a team lead in the lab this year and, and has a lot of great experiences to share. Uh, my name is Micah. As Matt said, I'm a team lead this year. I lead a team of four other lab students um, in conjunction with a student director that helps lead our team as well. I just wanted to share a little bit about the skills I've developed. Uh, by working for the lab and uh, why someone maybe who's not considering a career in transactional work should still consider working with the corporate lab. Um, so as for skills, I think an important thing that you get to do with the lab is just to understand what good work product looks like because you're dealing with so much more work product than you do otherwise in law school. Um, I worked for two different firms last summer and I would say that over three quarters of the lab I've done uh, significantly more uh, work and seen more real work product than I did working for both those firms combined just because of the longer time frame that's very helpful um, and especially if you do become a team lead you get also the ability to learn how to communicate with clients um, you learn how to efficiently quickly respectfully send clear emails to a lawyer who is superior to you in the food chain uh, and that's really important regardless of what kind of practice you're going to go into. Um, it's just an essential skill. And I didn't realize how difficult it was until I started working for the corporate lab. And I've learned a lot uh, by working for the corporate lab in that regard. Um, and then why would someone who maybe wants to do litigation like me uh, consider working with the corporate lab? I think it's important to emphasize, as has already been touched upon, that corporations need all kinds of different work. So it's not like we're just drafting contracts. I think, in fact, with my team, we've done a little bit more um, in terms of research and writing than we have with contract drafting this year, although we've certainly done both. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. But I think even more importantly, you get huge lessons in just how to deal with clients and how to deal with, you know, attorneys from a general counsel's office who are pretty strongly analogous, I would say, to senior attorneys because they're people that are giving you a work product or a work project and they're telling you what they need and you need to learn how to communicate with those people in any area of the law. Um, and I think that's a really, really crucial skill for any lawyer um, and it's something you can absolutely develop uh, via the corporate lab in addition to doing both transactional work and uh, research type work. So essentially corporate lab is great if you wanna do transactional work, but if you wanna do litigation, you should also really strongly consider it. I think to, to Micah's point, um, it, it's important to remember that litigation, you know, never happens in a vacuum. So even if you do go into uh, into litigation following law school, having exposure to the, the, the business decisions that have been made prior to litigation or the contract drafting um, and familiarizing yourself with certain just how contracts work, how they're negotiated, um, it, it can be very helpful down, down the line if you do wind up in litigation to kind of have some background in all of that. And just one other thing, um, I know Micah mentioned um, teamwork. One thing that we do stress in the lab is the ability to work in teams because we have so many clients and so many students. We group our students into teams of about four or five usually um, and match them with about three to five clients depending on, on, on who the clients are. And that way it allows all the students to get, you know, um, a wide variety of experience with different, different size clients, clients in different industries, and also um, some certain clients tend to have different, um, you know, different focus areas in their assignments. So we like to give everyone as broad of an experience as possible. Feel Sorry. free to reach out to any of us if, if you have any questions. Thanks to all of you for the, that overview of the corporate lab. Um, and next, let's hear from Emily Underwood uh, about the innovation clinic. So I'm the director of the Innovation Clinic. Great to see you all here today and nice to meet you. Um, for those who don't know, the Innovation Clinic is a transactional and regulatory clinic, um, which means that we do basically all kinds of work other than litigation. Um, and then like the corporate lab, we don't do any hard IP either, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, now, our clients are all startups and venture capital firms. In an ideal world, all of these clients are doing something really new and innovative in their industry, 
Um, but a lot of times our clients are from the University of Chicago ecosystem. They have some other connection to the University of Chicago um, and we'll support them even if they are in some more you know, common uh, kind of product like consumer goods or something like that. Um, and then also venture capital firms will assist them on some of the work for their portfolio companies, uh, as well as in researching and reporting back on issues that affect the venture capital firm rather than the portfolio company itself. Uh, we are industry agnostic, so we will represent startups, whether they are in biotech, retail, food and beverage, fintech, um, and we have done projects in all of those, uh, sports, uh, pharmaceuticals, so we're kind of all over the board. And that gives you a really good preparation if you're going to be a transactional or regulatory lawyer where you will be called upon when a deal is arising with a certain client in a certain industry to become an expert on that industry, even though you may have no prior experience in it. Um, so it keeps things really fresh that you get to jump around between a lot of different kinds of products and see the different uh, issues that might come up on the same type of project, but for two very, very different companies. Um, so that's the general idea of what we're doing in Innovation Clinic, transactional and regulatory work, startups and venture capital firms, both inside the University of Chicago's uh, ecosystem, as well as around the entire country. Um, some are alums and some are not in all different industries. Um, some things that I hope that students are able to do after they have participated in the Innovation Clinic. Uh, well, first and foremost, that you're familiar with the tech and venture capital ecosystem. My goal is that you'll come out of the clinic having some sort of cognizable point of view on uh, whether that's a practice that you want to go into, as well as having some background knowledge of that practice. So that when you go to a firm or when you go to work in-house for a startup uh, and someone asks you to do something like negotiate a series a term sheet or negotiate the new deal with a new founder for their equity, you'll have some place to start from and actually be able to run that transaction, which is something that without that kind of training, you might not otherwise be able to do until you're a third or fourth year associate. Uh, I also, developing substantive skills for transactional practice, right? I think this is a really great clinic for anyone who wants to be a transactional lawyer. Uh, not just someone who wants to work with startups, because you're doing a lot of contract drafting, a lot of negotiation, um, a lot of work with the actual terms and how they operate and thinking about how to draft them appropriately. Um, so you're developing those substantive skills, right? Um, it's also a great course for students who are interested in being litigators. Um, I have had students in the course, even though we don't do any litigation, who are totally upfront that they are planning on doing litigation when they graduate, because as a litigator, you will still need to have that understanding of how a business worked, um, of how to understand a technology, if it's applicable to that kind of litigation, you'll still have to draft settlement agreements. So those drafting skills are really important to develop. Um, so I think the course is equally useful for that group of students as well. Um, as Josh and David were saying, you also develop soft skills for client readiness. So things like um, managing client expectations, how to conduct a client call, how to respond to unanticipated questions on the fly, things like that you will learn in this clinic. Um, one thing that differentiates the innovation clinic is that since all of our clients are startups and don't really have any legal background at all, or our venture capital clients who might have a lawyer in-house but who don't specialize in the kind of subject area that they're asking us to look into, um, there's a lot of opportunity to become and then position yourself with the client as the expert on something that you may not have known anything about. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for coaching our clients, which can help you to sort of test how well you actually understand the material yourself. Um, and then finally, post-graduation employment. A lot of students in the innovation clinic have gone on to work full-time for clients that they came across in the innovation clinic. Um, whether that's VC firms or uh, startups, and have also gone on to work part-time for those startups and those VC firms during the school year as well. Um, so certainly something you can get out of this clinic. The clinic sort of has two components. Uh, one is the client work. I won't go too much into depth about that now because Andy is going to talk to you guys a little bit about what he's been working on in clinic. Uh, but these are some of the kinds of matters you could expect to work for a startup or our venture capital clients on were you to join the clinic. 
Um, we also have, uh, I should note actually that the regulatory piece of our clinic is really a huge differentiator and something that's highly unusual across the country to see law school clinics in this space doing. Our regulatory work um, is not just, you know, help me figure out how to comply with new data privacy rules. Um, help me figure out how I need to label my food to comply with FDA rules. Um, those are the kinds of regulatory issues that I would describe as being known to someone, just not to our client yet. What we try to focus on are regulatory issues that really no one has an answer to yet. So one example of that is we were representing a 3D printing company that can 3D print affordable single family homes in I think it's about a week they have the time down to. And they wanted to know, we have all these different rules in different jurisdictions about what you're allowed to put on a building, how you have to construct the building. And those rules don't really seem to contemplate our product. So how do we go about designing a product rollout strategy in light of the fact that we can't even really go state by state, we almost have to go city by city. How can we think about lobbying to get some uniform kind of rule that works for us in place? Um, so if you think about the kinds of regulatory issues that Uber and Airbnb would have had 10 or 15 years ago, that's really what we're focused on. Class time, uh, we do a lot of different things. Uh, some things that are lectures that are on topics like the ones on this slide that are very, very common to all sorts of startups and venture capital firms. Um, simulations and exercises, so very similar to the corporate lab, we have a number of negotiation exercises. We have a multi-class M&A negotiation exercise. Uh, we have a founder dispute exercise where we review the terms that founders entered into and figure out you know, how can they model the best agreement or the best uh, solution to a problem for each of them uh, based on the dispute and the words in the agreement. So we'll do lots of things like that, basically to supplement on things that might not always come up in the clinic for clients, but that we nevertheless wanna make sure that students get exposure to. Um, and then finally, case rounds, which is something that you'll do in any clinic where students come together to share notes about what they have been working on, um, ask for help from other students who might have worked on something like that in the past, and then also to um, sort of share knowledge and sort of best practices for other students. Uh, we'll also do site visits and guest speakers. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a bunch of in-house counsel from startups come to talk to the students about what that lifestyle and that practice is like. Um, we've also had VCs come in. We have visited Sandbox Industries here in Chicago. We take trips over to the Polsky Center. Um, we have visited Ascent Reg Tech here in Chicago. So um, a lot of interacting with the VC and startup community here in Chicago during class time as well. Um, so I'll pause there and get out of this screen share. And then I will turn it over to Andrew to talk a little bit more about what he has gained from the clinic and the projects that he's worked on. I've had a, a, a really great time being part of the clinic for the past uh, three quarters. And I think like Professor Underwood mentioned, um, one of the really really neat things about uh, the innovation clinic is kind of the, is this the stage of companies you get to work with, but then the breadth of projects you, you get to work on uh, as a result. So, I mean, I've had opportunities to do everything from company for basic company formation, um, but then you'll get really interesting regulatory questions like, like Professor Underwood was talking about, um, or you, you might, you know, dive into a rabbit hole for a client um, who wants to kind of you know, they're, they're a brand new idea and they're trying to describe themselves. And so they have very interesting kind of trademark related questions of what they can or can't say um, and use other companies to describe themselves. Uh, one of the coolest experiences, and I think this is very much unique to working with clients the size of the innovation that, that the innovation clinic or the stage that the innovation clinic does, um, like, well, proudest moments was like, I went to a, a client who I had worked on their terms of service and their privacy policy. And so I like, I was on their website for something else. Uh, and then, you know, at the bottom of the page for the first time, they have a terms of service and privacy policy. And like, that was my work kind of. And, and so like getting to see that and have that kind of impact, um, like that's, that's really cool. Um, I think, uh, one of the, it, it, it's really useful, whether you're looking to eventually work for for startups or whether you want to maybe eventually start your own company um, whether you're interested in venture capital I, th I think the clinic gives you a good window into 
what those first steps as a company look like and what the steps for, for a company that maybe all of the answers are in front of them because they're doing something very new. Um, and also, uh, Professor Underwood touched on this, but it's, it's really great to get to be, um, to, to, to fulfill the role of kind of expert or advisor in a way for a, for a, for a client who isn't maybe very legally sophisticated. And so you, you get to have that kind of relationship, which maybe you wouldn't be able to have um, with, with much larger clients. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend uh, the Innovation Clinic for, for anyone interested kind of in generally in those spaces. Uh, and I'll be, you know, I know we're delaying questions to the end, but I'll be happy to, to take any questions anyone has uh, when we get to questions uh, and anyone can feel free to also reach out to me. My, it's just my last name, Zeller. Uh, at U Chicago. Thank you both for that overview. Um, next, we'll hear from Beth Krieger from the Institute for Justice Clinic and Entrepreneurship. Thanks for joining us today to learn about um, the variety of, of opportunities we've got in these amazing transactional clinics at the law school. I'm going to share my screen, give you a little overview of some of the things that we're up to. Um, so the IJ Clinic on Entrepreneurship is, um, I, I think there are three kind of main things to, to take away about what makes the IJ clinics kind of special within the law school. We serve low income entrepreneurs in the community. Um, we provide in-depth wraparound kind of general counsel for those small businesses, um, oftentimes for years. Um, we advocate for policy reform for our clients and for the community of entrepreneurs in Chicago. And we eat, <laughs> just had to throw that in, given a, a picture of, of one of our many clients over the years that makes delicious food. Gotta, gotta sample it, you know, make sure we're spotting all the issues. Um, I think you're all aware, we've all got to be aware after the year plus we've had about what um, small businesses mean to you, um, what small businesses mean to our city, um, what the opportunities for entrepreneurship mean to people who may have been displaced from their work, um, may be trying to figure out a better way to do something um, than has been done before, um, maybe trying to, to open a storefront in a neighborhood where the, it's been vacant for a long time. Um, you know, these uh, low income entrepreneurs that we serve are, are such kind of powerful, courageous, creative people. Um, and it's, it's really kind of an honor and, and a joy to work with them as they're shaping these businesses that make their dreams come true, create jobs in the community, um, serve customers who may never have had that kind of opportunity or service before, um, sometimes change an industry with, with a new invention or a new product that's never um, been seen before. So the, as we work with our clients over years, we get to really um, become their trusted advisors, their, their kind of go-to resources as they're figuring out um, kind of all of the steps along the journey. Um, whoops, went all the way to the end. Um, I just wanted to introduce a couple of our clients to give you a sense of folks we work for. Um, you see Johans Lacour holding up one of his shoes. Um, that he makes. Johans learned leather work in prison, actually. Um, and when he came home, he wanted to pursue work that um, would utilize his new skills. And he makes these fantastic um, designer leather bags and, and custom sneakers um, and is building an amazing brand right here in Chicago. He was featured in the Smithsonian Magazine, actually, in an article about artisans. Um, next to him, you see Aya who just opened Haji Healing Salon, not far from the law school, last weekend. Um, so she just finished her first week in this new location <clears throat> where she'll be offering plants for sale and, and, um, and community acupuncture and all sorts of things. Um, it's been an interesting go for us as her lawyers, figuring out what the law required and what her contracts needed to be and so forth for this unique mix of, of services and retail in this unique space that she's built out. Um, Cut Cats Courier is a worker-owned bicycle messenger service. They deliver food for restaurants. You can imagine they're a business that's been busier during the pandemic. 
Um, below that is a picture of Denobi detergent, a husband and wife team who make a plant-based detergent. They won our Southside pitch competition, um, which is the moment that <laughs> that picture catches. And then next to them are um, two friends from Back of the Yards, which is a neighborhood here in Chicago named for its proximity to the old stockyards. Um, these friends grew up in back of the yards and when they, it was only when they went off to college that they discovered how great it was to have a neighborhood coffee house. Um, they wanted to bring that back home to, to the neighborhood where they grew up. They couldn't convince any of the big namers to, to open coffee shops there, even though they did their research and found out that um, the Mexican American community in back of the yards actually drinks more coffee uh, than other other communities around the city, so they started their own. You can imagine all of the all of the trademark and um, real estate issues, this employment issues, the tax issues that go into running a coffee shop and expanding it to become a roastery and into more locations, as well as you know the issues that come up in structuring the enterprise and, and the relationship between the owners and so on. So that's just a start, a, a taste of some of the legal work we do. This week alone, we've got students you know, uh, working with the trademark office on trademark applications and responses to the trademark office, amending operating agreements um, to, to redesign how the owners of a business vote and um, share the profits in their businesses. Um, we've got people working with the city of Chicago to get businesses licensed. Um, and uh, writing contracts for collaborations with other businesses to design products together um, and so on and so forth. It's a wide variety of work um, that comes up for these businesses along the way. And um, so students in the IJ clinic get a chance to do a wide variety of things in close uh, contact with their clients in close contact with their supervisors. Um, so we go back and forth all the time. We're, we're brainstorming together. We're figuring out the best plan of attack and um, going back and forth with revisions again and again to, to uh, answer our clients' questions the best way possible. And then kind of lastly, I just wanted to highlight that we're also a watchdog for low-income entrepreneurs. Um, as you can imagine, it's hard to start a business right now. Um, we and and it's our part of our mission to kind of clear the barriers. Um, so we've done work to legalize push carts selling food um, just in the last couple of months. Um, an ordinance that was drafted by students was passed in city council to make it easier to have a home based business in Chicago. We're working on um, a bill in Springfield, also largely drafted by a student um, that would. Uh, make it legal to sell homemade food in more places. Um, we wrote with a student um, a letter to the SBA um, challenging some of the rules they had for the, the payroll protection program that made it hard for businesses owned by someone with a criminal record to get that loan um, and so on. So uh, that's a brief overview of the kind of work we do. And I'm going to hand it off to Marina to tell you about the student experience and she'll be followed on by Brian Polk. I just want to start off by saying clinic has been one of the most impactful experiences at my time at UChicago. I've done two clinics and um, one thing I particularly like about um, the clinic I'm currently in is that you can really have a huge impact on someone's life. You know we are serving low-income micro businesses, small businesses in the Chicago area and in some ways, these are the entrepreneurs who need the most assistance. These are the entrepreneurs who have uh, really limited access to these types of resources. So it's incredible to be able to um, do what might seem like very simple research to you and realize what a big impact this has for a business. So, you know, I'm thinking about all of the I've done work with Nobi Detergent, which, again, they won Southside Pitch. They're an awesome couple um, making huge strides and it's been amazing to watch their business grow and um, being able to just issue spot and during conversations and help them navigate their growth has been an um, incredible learning experience for me, but wonderful to see the impact on them as small entrepreneurs. Um, I've also had the opportunity to just work across a ton of areas I never expected. So 
um, you know, besides building and reviewing contracts. Um, I've also done more work around protecting IP and, and now I'm starting some trademark research. Um, we've had some conversations with experts in labeling law. Uh, I put together this kind of intensive um, marketing workbook. So I was able to build, uh, build off of some old consulting skills that I brought uh, with me to law school and, you know, give the client something really uh, usable for them as they're navigating what their marketing will look like going forward. So, you know, these are just a couple examples of things I've gotten to work on. I feel like clinic is just such an excellent way to prepare yourself. And, um, you know, I'm headed into big law and this is a great way for me to build the skills that will be helpful for me in my career and make a huge impact while I'm here as a student. I think Marina really said it really well. I mean, for me, honestly, as somebody who came into law school very uncertain about what sort of practice areas I hope to go into after I graduate, I think the IJ Clinic has really been amazing, like Marina said, really because of the diversity of projects that you do. I've done things, intellectual property, FDA regulations, contract drafting, important export stuff this week, uh, and that was all for one client. Uh, so the amount of you'd be amazed how many different legal issues can touch even a small business. I think, you know, especially by virtue of being a small business, when you're still deciding, you know, the direction your business will develop, you especially have to explore a lot of different angles. So it's really great to, you know, plot out your own future and your own legal career based on what you like. Um, and I think also, you know, I, I really loved law school, but I think it's very easy to become a little bit, uh, Jade, with how kind of abstract a lot of the problems we attack, you know, in class can seem. And one of the great things about IJ is how hands-on and how you can see the law really impacting people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, I've done things like, you know, going to a manufacturing site with one of our clients to sign a new manufacturing agreement, which is, you know, especially in the U.S., it's very cool to see a manufacturing agreement uh, being sold. I think seeing that industry here is a very cool experience. Um, and uh, you know, next week, me and a few friends in the clinic are going to Haji Healing Salon to see their new opening. So it's just very interesting to see the way law can impact people on a very tangible basis uh, in a sense that you don't often get to see in law school. Great. Thank you all for that overview. Um, so I'll go I'll, I'll, uh, be the anchor man here um, and tell you a bit about the Housing Initiative Transactional Clinic. We are a public interest clinic. We're part of the Edwin F. Mandel Legal Aid Clinic. Uh, we're focused on the development of new affordable housing uh, in Chicago and Chicago land generally. Um, so that is our, our public mission. Uh, and we do that work um, representing nonprofits that are, that are engaged in building or rehabbing uh, new affordable housing units. And that brings us into contact with lots of uh, sophisticated partners. So I've listed here some of the some of the governmental agencies that fund affordable housing, uh, some of the nonprofit and uh, mainline banks that uh, provide subsidies, low interest loans, uh, and then some of the other public interest organizations like Legal Assistance Chicago and the Shriver Center, um, some government agencies that we partner with uh, on our development deals. Um, and then I've also listed here some of the law firms that, that work on our projects with us um, and this is a mix of uh, both big law or practices within big law that are focused on affordable housing development, uh, and then a, a kind of a nationwide network of boutique law firms that are part of the American Bar Association Forum on Affordable Housing and Community Development. Um, so that's sort of a, of a niche practice area that um, uh, uh, many people don't know about, um, but it can be a very appealing place to uh, work for a law firm, um, you know, have the law firm kind of salary and lifestyle, uh, and yet be working on projects where you feel good at the end of the day that you're uh, producing something that's a, a real social benefit, uh, namely uh, affordable housing for low-income people. So the work that we do in the um, housing transactional clinic is meant to carry over to lots of other transactional contexts, of course. Um, the, the stages of our deals that we work on are similar uh, to lots of areas of corporate and transactional practice. So this is just a timeline slide at the top. You can see the, the timeline for a, an M&A deal. And then at the bottom, same timeline for affordable housing development. And we, it goes through the same stages where there's 
uh, discussion of business terms early on, negotiation and drafting of some kind of master agreement that um, then kind of governs the rest of the transaction, a due diligence period uh, where the uh, parties are uh, making sure that the deal meets their expectations, kicking the tires of the asset, kicking the tires of the borrower, um, their counterpart uh, to the contracts, and then a closing where the deal is consummated. Uh, we just had a closing last week for one of our co-op clients, which the students handled uh, quite ably. I want to spend a few minutes just describing one of our projects that we're working on now, um, just as an example. Um, uh, so this is a picture of a building in Pilsen, uh, which is a neighborhood on the southwest part of Chicago. Uh, in, uh, for many decades, it's been primarily a Latino, Mexican-American neighborhood. It has some amazing public art. Uh, this is just a picture of one of the murals, uh, the buildings in Pilsen. And in recent years, uh, Pilsen has really been facing a lot of gentrification pressure. It's kind of been discovered as the, the new hot Chicago neighborhood. Lots of uh, more upper income people moving in, uh, which puts a lot of pressure on land prices. Lots of buildings turning over, being purchased by developers and creating market rate housing um, or commercial establishments that the longtime residents just simply can't afford. So our client kind of grew out of that uh, anti-gentrification initiative in Pilsen. Um, it's called the Pilsen Housing Cooperative, or PICO. Uh, as one of the founders described it to me, um, he said, we just got tired of crying in our beer about all the gentrification in Pilsen and how people were being displaced and moving out. So we decided to do something about it. And what they decided to do was to form Limited Equity Housing Cooperative which is a form of home ownership um, where a group, in this case, a group of, of neighbors, longtime Pilsen residents, uh, including a number of artists and one pretty famous muralist who did a lot of those murals in Pilsen, uh, formed together or came together to form a nonprofit. Uh, uh, and you see in step three, there's lots of legal work here, which our clinic had worked on with them. Uh, so they formed a nonprofit uh, corporation, which is a housing cooperative, uh, and then the nonprofit uh, has now acquired its first building. It's working on acquiring its second building. And it's meant to be a scattered site co-op where each of the residents is a shareholder of this nonprofit. Uh, and by virtue of, of purchasing a share, they have the right to occupy one of the units. And because it's communally owned, they're able to restrict the resale prices of the housing um, so that it, the units won't turn over at market rate anymore, but they'll turn over uh, at a formula rate that's designed to keep the, the apartment affordable uh, for the very long term. Uh, so we formed the Pilsen Co-op, we represented them uh, in acquiring their first multifamily building in Pilsen. Meanwhile, um, in other parts of the city, um, lots of market rate development is happening. Uh, and this project has a real impact on our Pico client. This is a, a luxury condominium project that's being planned um, about a mile and a half away from Pilsen. Um, so why, why does this affect uh, Pico at all? Well, it turns out that the city has a program called the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, which says that if you're a developer doing a market rate project in Chicago, uh, and you're coming to the city for any form of housing assistance or development assistance, rather, including uh, any kind of zoning change, then you are required to make a contribution to the affordable housing inventory in Chicago. And that contribution can sometimes mean paying money into a fund that the city then uses to, to finance affordable housing developments, or it could mean building units yourself as a developer uh, either at your project or off-site within a certain radius uh, and creating affordable housing units that way. So the developer of that luxury condominium building uh, finds themselves in what's called the Pilsen Little Village ARO pilot area, which is a particular geography that includes Pilsen where the city wants these developers to create affordable housing. So that brings the, the developer to Pico. Um, to say, look, we want to partner with you. 
and build and support you in your mission of creating new affordable units in, in Hilson. And we'd love it if they were owned by the co-op and support your mission. Um, we have um, a commitment um, that the city is requiring us to make of somewhere around $1.2 million. Uh, and we'd like to, to work with PICO in developing some new housing in Hilson. So um, this is most welcome news, um, $1.2 billion. Uh, and we've been engaged with our client and with the developer in trying to decide what's the best way to use this incoming source of funds uh, for the acquisition of PICO's next building. So PICO is under contract to buy this building already. Uh, and here are some of the structures that we're thinking about within the clinic about how to use this subsidy. One structure would be the, the building seller um, conveys the building to the developer, the luxury condo developer. That developer then rehabs the building and then transfers the building, deeds it over to PICO. Another structure um, could be the seller uh, conveys the building to a limited liability company that we form in conjunction with the developer. Uh, the rehab occurs, and then the developer exits that LLC, probably by transferring its membership interest in the LLC over to PICO. So PICO will be the sole owner of that limited liability company. And then the third structure we're thinking about is um, PICO acquires the building and then hires the developer pursuant to basically like a turnkey developer contract where the developer sort of fee for service where the developer agrees to use their resources and expertise to rehab the property according to PICO's specs uh, and PICO owns the project throughout the course of that whole process. All right, so in thinking through some of these structuring options, here are some of the issues that we're uh, working through with our client. So one is uh, a big timing question. Um, the, the development of this luxury condo building is what triggers the developer's contributions to PICO. Uh, and that project is really not on the same timeline right now as, as PICO's acquisition of its next building. Um, so figuring out how we can bridge that timing gap is, uh, is an issue. Second, the Affordable Requirements Ordinance is not really set up for this kind of joint venture uh, or for this kind of rehab. Uh, and although the program provides some ability for the city to waive some of those regulatory requirements, figuring out with them what's waivable and what's not uh, is kind of an ongoing process. Next, anytime you're doing a joint venture, um, you have to think about who controls that joint venture and negotiate those business terms. Uh, and who's going to control the rehab process, who makes the final decisions about what rehab is going to be taking place, who will be hiring as contractors, all of that kind of joint kind of venture negotiation is coming to the fore. And then last, uh, in looking at those three structures uh, and contemplating others, we need to think about minimizing income tax, capital gains tax, and transfer tax to make sure we are creating the most efficient uh, transactional structure that we can. All right, so it's very much a work in progress. And I bring it up uh, because it raises lots of common themes uh, for the transactions that we work on in the housing initiative. Uh, so there's always lots of contract drafting and review. Any one of those three structures is going to involve uh, plenty of contract work. Uh, we're working closely with our client uh, to resolve these business issues uh, and then negotiating with the other side how to structure it. Um, Oftentimes, our, um, our deals are not super straightforward, and we have to make lots of decisions about what contracts to put in place, what kinds of entities do we need to form. Uh, we have multiple business objectives that the parties are trying to satisfy, and we need to come up with a deal structure that works uh, to maximize um, those objectives. And then last, there's always a kind of an overlay of policy questions, right? So here we have a client who's trying to combat gentrification uh, in Hilson by creating housing co-ops. Uh, and how can co-ops best be situated to accomplish that mission? One of the big problems in Chicago is there's not a ready source of lending for incoming co-op membership purchasers. So there's lending available and some home buyer subsidies if you are buying a single family house or if you are buying a condo, there really isn't anything right now for co-op purchasers uh, and there really needs to be. And then second, is the affordable requirements ordinance, is it even a good idea? 
um, let's look at how it's structured. It's basically a tax on developers um, to accomplish a public goal of creating affordable housing units. Uh, is that the most efficient way to achieve that goal? Um, given that it's the tool that we have, how can it be improved? Um, as I mentioned, the ILO is not really um, set up for this kind of uh, rehab project, um, but it may be that by working through it in this example, we're gonna be able to create a model that then can help the ARO be responsive to lots of communities like Pilsen that are experiencing rapid gentrification. That ends the overview of our transactional projects. And now let's open it up uh, for any questions that you all have. Thanks for uh, spending your time here today, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, for people that have kind of, I mean, you've talked a little bit about the process of like, you know, matching into a clinic and, and how that aligns with like the, um, you know, just matching your classes in general. Um, but I was wondering if any of you just have particular advice, if there's, you know, a specific clinic or set of clinics that you're targeting, um, and maybe that's your clinic. Um, do you give any advice to students on like what's the best way to have the best chance of getting into that clinic? Um, or is it kind of just, you know, go through the process and, and um, just see how it goes when the, when the summer comes around? So again, I, as I mentioned, the students who work for us over the summer are pre-registered for the clinic. So that's a route into the clinic. But apart from that, um, there's really, um, there's really nothing that students can do to situate themselves, you know, with respect to a particular clinic. Um, but what I would suggest people do is, is reach out to the clinician or clinicians um, where they have the most interest and let them know that you're really interested in the clinic and why, uh, because we have some ability to control like the number of slots that we have in our clinic. And when we know that there's students out there who have really strong interest, um, you know, you can, you can sometimes open up new slots um, for the general student body uh, in registration that will then, you know, allow students to, to enter the clinic. I think we've been very successful um, when we know that there are students who really have a strong interest in the clinic and they're persistent and uh, we've been really successful about getting it into the clinic that they want to take. Some clinics, I don't think any of ours fall into this category. There are some clinics that have prerequisites. I believe so. So you know that's something to check in in the information you have about courses because um, that that's obviously <laughs> a sorting factor. But uh, other than that, I second what Jeff said, and we can let you know kind of if there's some kind of cycle to when we're going to have open spots. We can can take a look at our wait list, and if uh, we haven't had you know long wait lists of of people who haven't been getting into the IJ clinic, so. So I don't, I think, you know, we, we definitely work with students who were in the one or two slots in that wait list to figure out if we could get them in this quarter or the next. The prerequisites that, um, that were mentioned for the litigation clinics, are, they're really co-requisites. Uh, and they're things that you might expect. Um, so evidence uh, for, for clinics that are doing uh, federal litigation. Um, and then uh, either the intensive trial practice workshop or some other trial advocacy class um, is highly recommended and or a prerequisite for some of the litigation clinics. I think on the transactional side, you know, taking contract drafting is a great class to take. Um, and then of course, all kinds of business law classes at the law school, anything from corporations to tax, um, those can all be uh, very valuable by way of background, but we don't require them. Uh, clinics. And we're just about at the end of our time. Let me just thank everyone for participating today and coming to the meeting. And we really look forward to seeing many of you uh, in our clinics uh, down the road. Thanks, everyone.